Welcome back to Conscious Healing Beyond the Trip. I'm Dr. Jason Harris, physician, clinician, and explorer of the rapidly evolving world of psychedelic medicine and interventional psychiatry. On this podcast, we break down the science behind cutting edge mental health treatments from ketamine to psychedelic research to neuromodulation techniques. Today, we're diving into one of the most fascinating tools in the modern psychiatric arsenal transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. If you've ever wondered how placing a magnet near your scalp can treat depression or why insurance actually covers this when they hesitate on almost everything else, you're in the right place. What is TMS? Let's start with the basics. TMS is a non-invasive brain stimulation therapy that uses rapidly pulsed magnetic fields to activate targeted regions of the cortex. If that sounds like sci-fi, that's because it kind of is. But it's also deeply grounded in neuropsychology. But it's also deeply grounded in neurophysiology. Here's the simplest way to visualize it. Imagine your brain is a city. Neurons are the roads, and depression is a traffic jam in the prefrontal cortex, which is a critical hub for mood regulation, decision-making, and emotional processing. TMS is a traffic engineer with a magnetic signal instead of a shovel. It's going to clear the blockages and reroute the traffic to get the city functioning again. These magnetic pulses create a small, controlled electrical currents in the brain, which are enough to stimulate underactive neural networks without requiring anesthesia, medications, or systemic side effects. Let's talk about the science and how it works. I'm gonna geek out for a few minutes because this is so freaking cool. TMS works through electromagnetic induction. A coil is placed on the scalp and generates magnetic pulses that pass painlessly through the skull and induce electrical activity in targeted neurons. The area that is most commonly targeted is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is abbreviated DLPFC which is a region to show to be shown uh, it's a region shown to be underactive in major depression so what does the stimulation do it increases neural firing which causes underactive circuits to begin firing normally again it enhances neuroplasticity we've talked about this numerous times on my other podcasts but think about it rewiring and forming new synaptic connections It modulates deeper limbic structures. So even though TMS only directly reaches superficial cortex, it indirectly induces mood centers like the amygdala and hippocampus. It balances hemispheric activity. So in depression, the left prefrontal cortex tends to underperform while the right side overcompensates. TMS helps to restore this equilibrium. So if ketamine is a chemical neuroplasticity, TMS is electrical neuroplasticity. They work differently, but beautifully complement one another. Next, let's talk about the types of TMS, because not all magnets are created equal. There are multiple forms of TMS, and here's a quick breakdown. You have standard TMS or RTMS, which is repetitive pulses, in 20 to 40 minute sessions. It's been FDA approved since 2008 for depression. You have theta burst stimulation or ITBS and think about that as a TMS on fast forward. Most sessions are three to 10 minutes and they're delivered multiple sessions throughout a day. It's FDA approved, but it's not covered by most insurances at this time. We see a similar efficacy with dramatically shorter session times. We have deep TMS or DTMS. It uses a different type of coil called an H coil. It reaches deeper brain structures and it's marketed heavily for OCD. Finally, we have the accelerated TMS, which is based on the Stanford Saint protocol. You have multiple sessions per day and it's completed in about one week. 
The early research suggests extremely high remission rates in the 70 to 90 percent. Unless you're actually going to Stanford or somebody that has a, you know, they're working with Stanford, you're not going to get the SAINT protocol because it involves using an MRI to pinpoint the exact location in the brain that needs to be pinpointed. And you have to not only have the MRI, which increases costs, but they also have a computer program that uses that MRI and targets a specific part of the brain. If you're not going to Stanford or somebody associated with Stanford, you're getting the AINT protocol, which is still an accelerated protocol, but you're not using MRI targeted locations. Each style of TMS has advantages depending on diagnosis, severity, and patient tolerance. So what conditions can TMS treat? While most people associate TMS with depression, it's used for many other things. First, major depressive disorder. It was first approved in 2008 for adults who failed at least one antidepressant trial. It's commonly used for treatment-resistant depression. Number two, obsessive compulsive disorder. It was FDA cleared in 2018 and uses that deep TMS H coil to target the anterior cingulate and medial prefrontal cortex. Number three, smoking cessation and nicotine dependence. It was FDA cleared in 2020 and it targets brain areas related to craving and reward circuitry. And number four, migraines. It was FDA cleared for acute treatment and prevention. It uses a single pulse TMS or STMS devices rather than repetitive TMS. This one's interesting because you take the device home, you use it every morning, and then you also use it at the onset of migraines. It is FDA approved, but insurance aren't covering it just yet. So these following treatments are not FDA cleared, but are being studied and even offered in a lot of clinics. Anxiety disorders, PTSD, ADHD, bipolar depression, chronic pain, tinnitus, fibromyalgia, long COVID depression with cognitive symptoms, post-stroke rehabilitation, autism spectrum conditions, and cognitive enhancement. What's interesting is how broad the applications are becoming. Basically, any disorder involving dysregulated neural circuits is a candidate for neuromodulation. So what does the patient actually experience when they come in for a TMS treatment? One thing that's always asked is, what does it feel like? The honest answer is, imagine someone gently tapping a pencil eraser against your scalp, but at a really fast rhythm. That's pretty much it. No anesthesia, no sedation, no fasting. The patients sit in the chair, stay awake, and often chat, read, and listen to music during their treatments. Afterwards, there's no downtime, there's no grogginess. They can drive, go back to work, or just go back to their daily life immediately. The side effects are very minimal. Some people have a mild headache, there's some scalp discomfort, and very rarely it can cause a seizure. And it's less than 1 in 1,000 times that it causes a seizure. And it's usually because the machine is turned up too high or it's not in the right location for the treatment of TMS or the treatment of whatever we're treating with the TMS. Compared to medications, the side effect profile is incredibly favorable. So now let's talk about how TMS compares to ketamine and other psychedelic therapies. Because this podcast frequently covers ketamine and psychedelic medicine, let's talk about where TMS fits in. All right, the similarities. All of them promote neuroplasticity. All of them treat mood disorders. All can succeed when traditional medications fail. But here are the differences. TMS uses an electrical stimulation. There's no altered consciousness. It does require daily visits, and the improvement is more gradual than we would see with ketamine or other psychedelics. But the insurance coverage is very strong. Ketamine causes a chemical stimulation. It produces a psychedelic adjacent preceptual shifts, so you're going to have a psychedelic experience. It works fast, sometimes within days to weeks. Out-of-pocket costs for many patients 
are high for ketamine therapy. Uh, classic psychedelics, which are all still in research, cause a profound altered state of experience. They require therapy integration, and there's still lots of regulatory status around that. I mean, it's still federally illegal to have, even though there's lots of cities and states that are decriminalizing it. You can have potentially long-lasting changes from just one or two sessions. That's where it benefits. Where TMS shines, patients who cannot tolerate medications, don't want an altered state, or need a non-drug intervention because of where they work or what they do in their jobs, or many other reasons. Now let's talk about where TMS and ketamine work together and shine together. We're still doing lots of research, but in clinical observation, there's synergy. Ketamine seems to loosen up those stuck networks and TMS helps to retrain them. We may see combined protocols become standard soon. There's still lots of research going on about this. The question I always get is, does TMS actually work? The short answer is yes, but let's be honest, it's not magic. Typical remission rates for TMS and treatment-resistant depression hover around 30 to 40 percent. 60 to 70 percent of patients have a response that's statistically significant. These are huge for non-drug treatments with minimal side effects. The new accelerated SAINT protocol is showing even better numbers in the 70 to 90 percent range remission in the early trials. The long-term benefits seem to vary. Some patients remain well for years. Some need maintenance sessions every year. And some have a full relapse and would benefit from a full repeat course. It's not perfect, but it's one of the most promising tools we have. So what's the future of TMS? We're entering a new era of precision neuromodulation. And future directions are including closed-loop TMS, which means we're going to adjust stimulation patterns in real time based on brain activity. We have personalized targeting using MRI-based neuronavigation. And we're going to see us combining TMS with psychedelics, virtual reality therapy, or cognitive therapy. We're seeing expanded insurance coverage for those other conditions beyond just depression. We're starting to see OCD. We're starting to see smoking cessation. And I think in the future, we'll see the STMS and migraines start to get covered by insurance. But right now, really, it's just depression that most insurances cover. As we learn more about the functional brain networks, our ability to treat psychiatric disease becomes more precise, individualized, and more effective. So that's transcranial magnetic stimulation, a therapy that sits at the intersection of neuroscience, physics, and psychiatry. It's safe, effective, and remarkably elegant in its simplicity, using magnetic fields to help the brain heal itself. If you found this episode helpful, please share it with someone who might be considering TMS or is looking for alternatives to traditional medications. Stay tuned next week for our next episode where I'll discuss the holidays and mental health. This podcast is not medical advice. It's a conversation, one that's evolving. So talk to your doctor, ask the hard questions, but remember, your provider may not be up to date on the latest research or may just be close-minded to the use of psychedelics even though the science is there. Stay skeptical, but stay open-minded because sometimes the most healing paths are the ones we nearly forgot. Thanks for joining me on Conscious Healing Beyond the Trip. I'm Dr. Jason Harris. Until next time, stay curious and stay informed. Mm -hmm.